the mole balance equation, and we ended up with this system with n minus out plus generated is equal to accumulated. This is the key equation that we're going to be using over and over for the next few weeks. So we really want to understand what's going on, and we're going to see it being applied to uh, the first two types of reactions. So in is the molar flow in to our system. Out of J refers to the species we're considering. So if I was taking this system here, A going to a C as a composition reaction, J would either go to A, I could use B in there, or I could use C in there. So F sub to A, F sub to B, F sub to C, depending on which species I'm doing the mole balance for. The term G of J was a term we spent a bit more time on last night. That's the term that represents how fast we're generating that species by chemical reaction. So it's the moles per second of species J being generated. So in this particular setup I have got on the, this equation, A going to B plus C, what would you decide on G substitute J for the case when J is equal to A? So in other words, what is the sign of G substitute A? Subscript B. Okay. And G subscript C would be positive as well. So the key is here, these terms represent the individual rates for one species at a time. We would write this balance for one of the species, and we could write it for the second and the third. Every species that's present in the system, we could repeat that mole balance equation for. So point here, this is a per species balance. It would be redundant in this particular situation to write that mole balance down for B and C separately. Right? The, the mole balance for B is going to be the mole balance for C in general if we're, if we're um, generating B and C at the same rate. So but it's going to be, for a typical system, there's no B coming in. So the flow rate of B coming in is zero. The flow rate of B and C leaving are, are going to be the same inside the same system. The rate at which we're generating B and C are going to be the same. And then for the rate of accumulation of B and C are going to be the same. So we don't need to write this equation down for every single species. But for the key species that we're considering, uh, we would write this down. So part of the skill in solving reactive design problems is picking the particular species or species, or plural, that you need to use that equation for. So we'll see some of that coming through in the problem this evening. So we ended up there. The other key point is that G of J, being the molar flow of generation, the easiest way to, to simplify that, we look at the integral for it in Rj multiplied by V. So Rj multiplied by V, that simplification comes from the only in the more general equation where we're integrating R subscript J over the volume. So Rj, the rate at which we're generating species J in the most general sense, is a function of the location inside the reactor. In other words, it's a function of the volume. For certain specific cases, it's not a function of the volume. We'll see that in tonight's examples. But in general, the most general cases, Rj is actually a function of the location inside the reactant. So we cannot remove it outside the integral. But if, if it's not a volume dependent function, we can remove it outside the integral and we get the simplification of it. So this here is a simplification. And this is the general equation that always holds. So those are the two key things we learned in the class in the pre op five weeks. The rate, rates of generation. So let's take a look at this applied now to two reactor types. The first one we're going to consider is the batch reactor. So a batch reactor is a reactor where the key characteristic is that there's no inflow and no outflow. That's the primary characteristic of the batch reactor. So already, 
we have these two terms, fj0 and fj equal to 0. No inflow and no outflow. So a tremendous simplification already. That's why we're starting with this, with this reactor. So our equation then for a batch reactor is going to be G for the J species is equal to the rate of accumulation of J over time. So we, we put material into our reactor, we call that charging the reactor, put material into the reactor, close it up, then what? Let's take a look at what happens. So here's the batch reactor system. We've got an illustration of it on the left and a photo of, it, of an actual batch reactor on the right. On the left hand side here is a, is a theoretical reactor. It's taken from one of the master students a few years ago. And Cecilia was considering the case of uh, a specialty chemical production. So this company has several reagents that they charge to the reactor or put into the reactor is another way of saying it. Reagent one, reagent two, and a bit of water goes into the reactor. That's closed up, and then the reaction is initiated. There's several instruments on this reactor, temperature, pH, pressure that can be measured over time. An interesting measurement is the weight. So X1 down here is a loaded cell on which the reactor rests, and they measure the weight. And that's used to, to charge the reactor, so you know how much material you've added and you can monitor the progression of the reaction over time. So that's a key, key variable. This reactor also has a cooling jacket. So here, we're using brine, brine, salt water, flowing in, and then leaving. So if you're flowing at a colder temperature, leave at a warmer temperature, but it's removing heat from the system. So clearly this is an exothermic reaction taking place in the reactor. So this illustration is very common. On the right hand side is a photo of it. Let's just take a look at some of the detail down here. We're seeing the reactor and I help a bit here. Let's take a look. A side glass where we can see what's going on inside there. Very often that's just found out. You can't usually see too much on those. We're seeing a lot of instrumentation, a lot of piping going in. That's where we're charging the reactor. So there's valves on there that are dosing the correct amount of reagents. To, to the reactor. We're seeing the drive shaft for the impeller up there to provide agitation. Further up, we're seeing some of the instrumentation here, an old digital computer, pressure gauge, some of the valves up here that control the system. Batch reactors are some of the most sophisticated control systems and loops in a chemical plant. Here's another batch reactor, physical fermentation system. So Here's a brewing, a, a beer brewing company. I think this photo is from a beer brewing in Nairobi. It's simply just a set of vats that uses that for storage for long term. It's a very slow, natural reaction that's taking place. So we have a large batch reactor. Key variable of interest, how long? How much time do I have to wait until I get to the desired endpoint? So that's the key, key criteria for batch reactors, how long? So let's take a, look, take a look then at what we would get from that batch reactor. So with all that instrumentation, all those sensors that are on the batch reactor, we collect a lot of data over time. Here's a batch from a, from a publication that I worked on a few years ago with the company, FMC Corporation, it's an agricultural chemical. Uh, we wrote a publication on this that showed how we can control and monitor this batch over time efficiently. Let's take a look at what we get. Four variables I've shown here. One is, the first thing to notice before we go into the discussion is that this batch has multiple phases. In this particular case, we've got three of them. There's a period of 175 minutes where the key thing that's happening is this variable is ramping up. Stage two, key variable that's changing is this variable is ramping up. This is the dry temperature increasing. Stage three is really just a cooling period. So 175 minutes in stage one, about 75 minutes in stage two, 75 minutes in stage three. When you're dealing with batch processes, companies will call it stages, phases, or they'll just call it a part of the recipe. So batch processes are always recipe driven. And they use that terminology because it comes exactly from 
cooking, kitchens, chemistry, batch systems are really just large scale chemistry laboratory. So you can see that in this, this sort of equipment. Take your lab your container, you just blow it up to a large size, that's all that batch systems are. Okay, so the reason for going into that detail that I want you to understand this is that's going to help us understand where we see batch reactors. So batch reactors, I'm putting material in and I have to wait a certain amount of time, let the reaction go to completion, empty the reactor out. What type of systems would we expect batches, batch reactors to be useful for? What sort of chemical production? Paint. Why, why, why do you say paint? I'm not sure, I just heard that it's batch process. It, it's, it is. Paint is essentially a polymer, it's a latex. So it's uh, very well suited to, uh, to batch systems. I'll explain why in a minute. Yeah. Any, any others? Drinking spirits, so brewing, uh, any brewed products, spirits products, they're all created in batch processes. Anything else? What's the characteristic of, of these, these things that I've mentioned so far? It takes a long time. Something else. Small quantities. The key characteristic of batch systems is that you're producing products in small quantities. Because you charge this reactor, wait and wait, sometimes days, sometimes hours, empty out the reactor, clean it, refill it for the next batch, the next cycle. So this is a labor intensive process in some, some situations, but it's not a fast process, it's not a high volume process. The process that's producing material that's requiring large quantities like sulfuric acid or polyethylene, these require tons and tons of product per year. They're not suited to batch processes. So batch processes are commonly found when you've got small scales or low volumes. And the other characteristic is that it's extremely high value product for the most part. Okay? So pharmaceuticals, medicines, low volume of fine, complex organic chemicals, chemical molecules that are very hard to make, that require multiple stages, multiple steps in order to get to the final product. So if you think back to maybe a second year chemistry lab, there's multiple steps when you're synthesizing an organic molecule. This is perfectly suited to that because it's not something that you can just run on a continuous basis in a continuous <coughs> operating mode. Okay, so whenever we've got multiple steps, small scales, high value product, and low volumes, you'll see batch processes. Okay, so it's important when we're studying reactor design, we don't just focus on the equations and on the theory, but we also actually understand what the principle is and what, why we might use them in certain conditions or others. Any, any questions on that? Latex is produced in batch reactors because one thing we want is the uniformity of it. So you want your paint to be fairly uniform so it, it, you, you mix well until the reaction proceeds to a certain known condition. You end your batch, discharge, and you can, can uh, go from that point onwards. Can you please explain what you mean by multiple steps? So multiple steps in the pre recipe. Here's a recipe with three stages. So this company to produce this product, they have determined that the best way to make it is to go through a stage one where they're ramping up this variable, keeping this constant. So this variable here's flat line corresponds to the agitator speed. They're running that agitator at very low, eight revolutions per minute. Stage two corresponds to ramping up that speed of the impeller to 30 revolutions per minute while increasing the temperature. So there's two steps. The final step is the cooling down step. They bring the reactor temperature down to room temperature, essentially 25 degrees, where they can discharge it and go to the next step. There's not, it's not uncommon to see, uh, when I was working in the pharmaceutical industry, recipes of 15 to 20 steps. The more complex your recipe, the more automated you make it. So when it's a straightforward recipe like this, you can allow operators <coughs> to run it for you. There's, it's a very short process, 300 minutes, easy to make these changes, but we've got very uh, complex things that need to change, especially simultaneously for multiple steps. You don't want to risk making a mistake to automate it. So, so that's what we mean by multiple steps. Okay, so let's 
now that we've got that understanding, let's take a look at applying the general balance to the batch reactor. So we assume that when we've got the uh, material in the reactor, we're assuming it's well mixed. That's an important assumption. So we've got our, our impeller in there, our material. We've charged it <coughs> to the reactor. So here's my valve. I open it up, put, a, put material in, I close the valve, and I turn that impeller on. That material is well mixed in the reactor, so the reaction rate is not a function of location inside the reactor. The reaction rate at multiple points inside the reactor is the same value everywhere. So I can remove Rj out of the integral and simply call it Rj integrate volume over dv and get capital V. So cancel the flow in, cancel the flow out, those are both zero. G of J, substituting the simplification over there is equal to dn j minus v. In English, that says the rate at which we're accumulating species J inside the reactor is the rate of formation. That makes absolute sense. The rate at which it's accumulating is the rate at which we're forming it. The material has nowhere to go. It's inside the reactor. So the rate of accumulation inside the reactor is exactly the same rate as we're forming it. Okay, so that equation makes sense mathematically and conceptually. Notice though, one important point here is that we don't assume our volume to remain constant. For most reactions, especially liquid phase reactions, that is true. The volume inside the reactor is not going to change. But certain reactions lead to situations where the, the volume, the product being produced, cause an increase or a decrease in the total volume in the system. So these products have greater density or lower density. They occupy less space. And so this volume could either go up over time or go down over time. But for most systems that like the, it, it could go up and down by a few millimeters or, or by a small negligible amount. For the most part, though, um, we can safely assume for liquid phase system that the volume is constant. But this equation does not assume it. Right? So if, if the system actually did change over time, we would need to take that into account. So let me make that a bit more, more explicit. What we saying essentially is that every term inside that equation up there is a function of time. So to emphasize that, uh, I could write the rate of formation of species J, the number of, uh, sorry, the rate of accumulation, the number of moles of J is a function of time, the rate of formation is a function of time, and the volume is a function of time. <coughs> every variable in there can change over time, and we need to be aware of that especially given the fact that we're integrating relative to time dt, we must be clear on which variables actually are a function of time and which variables are not a function of time. Okay, so let's, one key thing I want to point out about this reactive design course is it's very easy to go and try and learn these individual equations. But there's, it's a pointless exercise. By the end of this course, there's going to be about 150 to 200 equations there's about three or four or five showing up every night, times 36 classes, easily there's going to be 150 equations. To try and memorize all of them is fruitless, which is why it's an open book exam, open book midterms. What I'd rather you do is we understand the concept of the most general equation, then to get to this equation out here, you can just work through the process every time, make the necessary simplifications that we require. So when I'm going through the simplification, understand why I'm doing it, but not what we end up with, okay? Because it's going much easier for you to derive it rather than for you to memorize every single one. So here, we've got the general equation for batch systems as a function. What I'd like you to take a look at now is this problem. <coughs> Straightforward batch problem, but let's take a, I want you to solve it for a few minutes and then we'll work through it together. We've got a decomposition of A going to 2B. And the rate of reaction is given by this formula over here. Minus RA is equal to K times K. Is that the rate of formation of A or is that the rate of depletion of A? Depletion. So we 
wrote that last night, that's the rate of completion of A minus RA, and the constant K is 0.23 minutes over one. Does that, do those units make sense? Inverse time? Yep, they need to be inverse time so that the left and the right hand side that makes sense. So rate is always moles per time per unit volume. Concentration is moles per unit volume. So therefore K in this system must have units of one over time. In this particular example, for first order kinetics, K has units of time up to the minus one. Second order system, K does not have those units. So K's units changes every single problem we deal with. So, so be, aware, be aware of that. Always check your consistency for your units. Constant volume batch reactor. Now we have down here that that volume of the batch reactor is 10 liters. Inlet concentration coming into the reactor, when we charge the reactor, we fill it up with material at a concentration of two moles of A per liter. The most important thing we want to know about batch reaction systems, how long? How long do we need to run this thing? In this case, we're wanting to know how long do we need to operate the batch so that we reach concentration at the outlet at the end of time where it's 10% of its initial volume, uh, 10% of its initial concentration. In other words, we want to see a 90% conversion. Very important question to know this time required because this is going to affect our production schedule. We need to empty the reactor, clean it out, get it set up for the next reaction, the next batch that's going in. So important to know how long do we have to wait before we have to do that. The faster we can run these batches, the more product we can make. Okay, so you don't want to overestimate this number, nor do you want to underestimate it. If you underestimate it, you're going to produce material with a proper, improper quality. So it takes two, three minutes. Work with the friend next to you, to the left or the right, and try, I don't expect to get to your answer, but at least set up the general balance, substitute in what you know, and try to get to a point where you can attempt to solve it. So take a minute or two, work through what you have.
So when you get an ODE, what do you do with the ODE? Do you have everyone have an ODE? Differential equation is set up yet? What's the definition of CA? Okay, so let's uh, let's just uh, quickly take a take a step here. Ca naught is the initial concentration of A in the reactor. So what we've done is we've opened up our valve. We've put in material here at 2 moles per liter. That's my concentration coming in. I closed the valve, I filled up that batch with 10 liters of material. So inside here, B is equal to 10 liters of, of material I added. It does not refer to the volume of the entire reactor, it only refers to the volume of the material added to the reactor. So very important what B represents here. 10 liters of CA coming in at 2 moles per liter, so 10 liters, so I've got 20 moles of A in that reactor. One thing to just emphasize here with this notation, CA0 is equal to CA at time equal to 0, which we then could also just write CA at T0. So a bit of shorthand notation there is that representation. So in my reactor now, this valve is closed, my exit valve is closed. I turn on the impeller or I initiate the reaction in some way. This question is a little bit artificial, right? Because if you've just got A sitting here by, by itself, it would have already started to react to a form of 2E already. But somehow we've got a mechanism to initiate the reaction. Maybe we add a bit of heat, maybe we add some catalyst, and we start the reaction. So A inside this reaction, in the reactor vessel, CA is initially at <coughs> zero, zero equal to two moles per liter. As that reaction progresses, A gets depleted, and we want to know how long it takes, how long do we keep operating that reactor until we get to 90% of what we started off with. And we're given this information. Now K is a positive value, 0.23 to the minute minus one. CA, Positive or negative value? Always positive. You never have a negative concentration. So minus RA, positive or negative? Definitely positive. So if minus RA is positive, that implies RA negative. Okay. Let's substitute it to the general equation now. So the general equation said the flow in minus flow out is equal to the flow in of J minus the flow out of J plus the rate of formation of J is equal to E and J by T. Do we use A or do we use B for J? Okay, can we use B? Absolutely. Which one makes more sense? A, the one you mentioned first, right? So, why is it more sensible to use A? You have more values for A? You have all the same values. If you can use B, you've got the same values for B as you for A. The rate of formation of B is just twice the rate of depletion of A. So you've got all the information for B that you have for A. The question is not looking for the final value of A. So let's use A. It's a more sensible choice in this case. So, Substitute your J's with A's, and we're ready to go. We know that's zero, we know that's zero. 
we have that. Can I go ahead and just substitute in here, say, g of a, we know from the simplification we learned last night, is ra times the volume is dna dt. Can I just go ahead and write that? Yes? Who says no? No? Why no? assumption, we must state it. So I can write this, provided I also write, assuming a well-mixed reactor. Without that qualifying statement, we cannot proceed to this step. So we must always state the simplification assumptions you make. This is why I'm stressing it's easy in reactive design and it's tempting in reactive design to simply memorize these simplified formulas. But if you don't remember what, what the assumptions were to get to that, you could be making a <coughs> So go from the general case, it's very quick to get to the simplified formulas, stating your assumptions along the way, and that way you'll be sure to land up with an appropriate simplification. So absolutely I can write that in. So RA times B is then the rate of formation of A with respect to time. What is RA? RA is minus kCa. So minus kCa times B is equal to dNa by dt. Let me move to this other board. Other suggestions? Could you integrate this CA is a function of time. CA is a function of time. NA is a function of time. Integrate both sides. Integrate both sides. Great. Yeah, you're going all the way to the right, right direction. So which what variables do I put on which side of the integral? V and K are constant, so we know those two, yeah. CA onto this side and DT. Okay, so minus K and B DT is equal to DNA divided by CA. No? We're assuming, assuming it's on. But then is that the volume of the volume? The volume. V always refers to the volume of the reacting system. Not the reactor. Okay, yeah, it's in a constant volume. It's in a batch reactor and it's operating in a constant volume. So yes, if you're not clear, make the make it make it clear in your answer. Let's let's add that here. Assume the reaction volume V is constant. Options here. One, one suggestion made by what's your name, sorry? Oh, Nick. By Nick was to substitute and change NA in terms of CA. Another option is to go the other way, to write CA in terms of NA. Either one works, and you can prove that to yourself. I will go with the option where I can put CA to NA. So CA is the moles of A divided by the volume. 
Let's sub that in. So CA is the moles of A. I get a bit of a simplification here in this case. The P disappeared. So now I can get minus K ET is equal to DNA over NA. Now it's the integrate. Variables related to NA that change as a function of here's NA are on the right, variables that are constant, and the DT are on the left. I can integrate them between the limits. What are the limits for the DT side? Anyone? Zero, two, I'm going to call it TF, T final. On the right hand side, NA zero, let's just use that notation, the initial number of moles inside the reactor to the final moles, NA F. Uh, since the question is asking for our final concentration and the volume is also constant, isn't DNA over NA the same thing as DCA over CA? Absolutely. You can work with either one. You could work with either one, you could work with NA and then just convert to CA at the end, or you could simply recognize that that integral right now is equal to DCA minus <coughs> because of the constant volumes. Absolutely correct. So if I integrate that, I get minus K times TF is equal to the natural log of NAF over NA. Zero. And we want to know the time TF, that's my search variable, this is what I'm looking for is TF, so that the final concentration <coughs> is 90% is converted or 10% of its initial value. In other words, that says the final number of moles is equal to 0.1 of the initial number of moles. Okay? So, that's equal to the log then of 0.1. So what's the answer? TF? 600 seconds or 10 minutes. So TF is equal to 10 minutes. solution, let's just do one final consistency check, which you should always do. Let's just check our units. Our units for K are inverse minutes. So the units of K are 1 over minutes. The units of TF are in minutes. So that's dimensionless on the left. The log of two variables that, that are ratio, dimensionless, so we've got that consistency of these two units. Always do that as a final quality check. So 10 minutes for us to reach 10% of its initial value or 90% conversion. Okay, very, very straightforward uh, question. That's a straightforward application of the null that. So now let's take a look in the time remaining here at the continuous stirred tank reactor. So CSTRs. You've seen this uh, in, in the labs, you've seen this in, in, in the chemistry uh, setup. It's a tank or a system or a beaker where you're providing agitation, enough agitation so that you can make assumption here as well that it's well mixed, that the properties throughout the reactor are constant everywhere. Okay. That implication is that Everything inside the reactor is at the same value. The temperatures, viscosities, all those intensive properties are at the same value. But a CSTR also has the difference with the batch reactor is we've got material coming in and we've got material leaving. So CSTR, let's illustrate it. Uh, I think it's a better illustration on the next slide. So I'm going to draw it. OK. 
effect. So there we go. CSTR, like a batch reactor, except we're continuously adding material in and we're continuously having material leaving with good mixing all the time. The key assumption with the CSTR that you must, this, that we're using here, is that the intensive properties inside this reactor are the same as the properties leaving the reactor. So the concentration is an intensive property, not a function of the system size. CJ inside the tank is the same as the CJ leaving. The temperature inside the tank is the same as the temperature leaving. The viscosity in the tank, the density in the tank, is the same as the density and viscosity leaving. So the only difference with the batch reactor and the CSTR is we're continuously adding material in, we're continuously pulling material out. Depending on how well mixed the system is, if I have poor mixing, you could understand and appreciate that you could get what's called a bypassing. Material can come in and pretty quickly just get maybe whisked around once or twice and leave right away. Other molecules can stay in that tank and get spun around there for, for hours and hours before they leave. We have essentially a distribution of time. Some molecules spend a long time in the reactor, other molecules spend a short time in the reactor. The key assumption is though, all the material in the reactor is at the same concentration. So it's not a totally correct assumption, but for well set up systems, it's, it can be a good and sometimes even an excellent approximation, depending on, on the level of agitation, depending on the baffles, and depending on the geometry of the internals that you've got set up there. That can be an excellent assumption to make. So CSTRs are used for some very important operations. They want, we use them when we want to be sure the system is operating at the same concentration all the time, the same temperature all the time. Okay? A batch reactor has profiles that change with time. You <coughs> see that over there. I will just go back to it and emphasize what, what I mean. Batch reactors have these profiles over time. The temperature changes with time. We call these trajectories. Okay, so this is the terminology that I'm going to use later on in the course. We have trajectories over time in batch reactors. In CSTRs, we have no such thing. That system is well mixed and at steady state, the material inside the tank is at the same concentration, same temperature, our trajectories are flat lines. We have essentially no trajectory. So the advantage of using the CSTR is we want to be in a system with constant temperature, constant concentration. We need to use CSTRs when we require good agitation to contact those materials. Remember, I said in the third prior class that the whole purpose of our modeling here, one key variable we have is the contacting pattern. We want good contacting patterns here. Um, so for example, a good example of CSTRs are when you need to suspend a catalyst inside the liquid phase to get your reaction going. Here's another example that's a, a good one to, to remember. If you, um, how many of you are familiar with uh, gold and mining or any mineral processing? A few people. So if we take gold as a, as a, as a useful example, if I take a piece of rock from, from, from a gold-bearing ore and I crush that rock up really finely, so I use jaw crushers or, or a crusher that essentially takes that rock and crushes this material to about 50 microns in size. So a very small diameter. Gold is typically exposed on the surface of the, of the, of the material. So there'll be a little bit of gold there, maybe a little bit of gold there. And there'll be some gold actually internal to that rock that is not exposed. If I take that rock, this crushed powder essentially, and I put it in a solution of sodium cyanide, it will leach the gold. It dissolves the gold away. Okay, so if you've got gold jewelry, you don't go stick it into cyanide. It will dissolve away. It literally goes into the liquid phase and disappears from you. So four AU, four molecules of gold attached to eight sodium cyanide, um, plus oxygen that's added to the reactor, plus water. So in South Africa, where I work with these systems for some years, we have a CSTR, you inject oxygen into the reactor, and you 
mix sodium cyanide with this rock and you keep this all suspended. You have to use a CSTR for this example. Because the contracting <coughs> pattern requires gold, sodium cyanide in the liquid phase, oxygen in the water on this. So you need to suspend this material and get that contacting happening. That will then create the so-called orocyanide complex plus four hydroxide atoms. That's desirable. You want an, a basic environment because if that pH drops, sodium cyanide turns into cyanide that you breathe in and you die. So you definitely want a high pH. Classic example of the CSTR where you have to have solid phase, liquid phase, and gas phase suspended in the same react to get that reaction going. Okay? So CSTR, when you need good contact between your material and you want constant operation. You definitely want constant operation when you're leaching this. You don't want your pH to change on you over time. pH, intensive property, you don't want that changing over time. You want to control that very well and keep it constant at the desired value for safety. So here's just some notation, and then next class we'll look up at, at some examples. But the notation we'll use is flow rate coming in. Now, let's pay attention. That's the molar flow rate, not mass flow rate. F here is moles of the species per unit time. C is the concentration in moles per liter, or moles per unit volume. And here's some really unfortunate notation. Very bad notation, but we have to deal with that because this is what's used in the textbook. Lowercase b, not to be confused with uppercase b, which unfortunately looks very similar if you're writing this very quickly by hand, especially. Lowercase b is the volumetric flow, meters cubed per unit time. Uppercase b, total liquid phase volume. Subscript zeros represent inlet conditions, no subscript zeros represent outlet conditions. And over here, I skipped over this earlier, but here's an example of a CSTR with a cooling coil, a jacket. You've got your inlet port on the top. Here's your outlet port for one of the, on one of the sides. Uh, I think if I, if I can interpret this figure correctly, that's actually the outlet port for the cooling. Here's your outlet port at the bottom to drain the reactor. And you've got your impeller and your motor that come in through that large port, so your agitation. So next class we'll look at applying the mole balance to this system. <coughs>